Americans are obsessed with dates. July 4th, 1776. December 7th, 1941. June 6th, 1944. These are just a few dates. November 9th, 1989 is the day the world changed. Occasionally they shout, Die Mauer muss weg, the wall must go. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? We may have to go to war tomorrow. They were going to give us maybe four days had the balloon gone up. Uh, I think now, golly, why didn't we see that it was going to happen so much quicker? All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light. So everybody's watching you. It, it's not just the United States Army that's watching you. It's it's the British government. It's the French government. It's at that time the Soviet Union because again, they were the four powers that won World War II. So they were all there in the city, and so you get that. You know, then you had the Berliners themselves. You had the German government, actually the, the West German government at that, that, that time watching you. You had all these governments and they were all, it was like all eyes on you. Well, maybe not specifically on you, but if you stepped out of line, they knew about it almost immediately. Almost immediately, Russia drew a curtain of secrecy between the other zones and her own. Behind this curtain, the Red Army began ruling Eastern Germany in a way to leave no doubt as to who lost the war. And Checkpoint Charlie today is still there uh, it still has the sign of you are now entering the American sector, you're now entering the French sector, you're now entering the Russian sector. Um, but the difference is there's no wall nearby. There are pieces of the wall nearby all around the actual original checkpoint that is the place where the famous tanks were face to face. Uh, there's McDonald's, there's a Starbucks there. There's uh, a couple of souvenir shops. So, you know, I think from those who knew about the wall coming down or the wall going up or what happened to Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin or things about the Berlin Brigade, it's an interesting historical anecdote. If you're a 16 year old American, you don't have a clue. If you're a 16 year old German, you certainly understand the importance of Checkpoint Charlie. Before I met my wife, uh, Janet, at Stripe, she was the medical writer. I used to cover the border troops on holidays. I was a single guy, so I didn't want, you know, a family guy to have to go out on the holidays. So Thanksgiving and Christmas, if I was in country, I would cover the border troops. And one year, I went out with a captain from the 3rd Infantry Division to where his troops were guarding the Fold a gap, and they were next to this town that had been cut in half at the end of the Cold War. And he took me in the jeep, and he took me, took a right, took another right, took a left, then took another left, and then a right. He said, "You are now surrounded by East Germany. There's only one way out of here." 
and you could see across the barbed wire, uh, there was an outpost where they were taking pictures of me because as a stripes reporter, I didn't wear a uniform. I wore civilian clothes and I had a camera and I was out there with a captain. So they thought this guy must be somebody important. He must be from the CIA or something or the NSA, who knows? And so this guy was furiously taking pictures of me. So somewhere in the Stasi records is probably a picture of me with this captain. And I was just a, you know, E5 buck sergeant um, who happened to be in civilian clothes. And uh, the captain got, had a great laugh about that. He said, he really thinks you're somebody important. <laughs> Berlin, 1961. The road has almost reached the present. General, what about if the Soviet Union uh, Khrushchev announces uh, tomorrow, which I think he will, that if we attack Cuba, that uh, it's going to be nuclear war? Uh, and uh, what's your judgment as to uh, the chances they'll fire these things off if we invade Cuba? Oh, uh, I don't believe it. Your daddy was home when you left. Your mama was home when you left. Your sister was home when you left. Your brother was home when you left. The dog was home when you left. The cat was home when you left. The fish was home when you left. Your daddy, your mama, your brother, your sister, the dog, the cat, the fish was home when you left. And that's the reason you left. I left my home. I left my home. To join the army. I was assigned to Berlin for a week on what they call the Berlin Orientation Tour. And essentially that was to acquaint uh, U.S. Army soldiers um, with uh, what our mission was in Berlin and to take them to the wall and then to take them into East Berlin and essentially uh, restate our right under the Four Power Treaty to have Americans in American military in East Berlin. Okay, so we get an alert and so I'm brand new there. So I'm hustling to get all my gear ready to go. Like I said, I just got there. And next thing I know, they say, no, you're not gonna go. You're gonna you're you're going to school of standards. So even the school of standards took priority over the alerts. It's just that's just how important that school was to make sure that you were trained to be a Berlin Brigade soldier, uh, which was uh, pretty awesome. In 1988, when I was a division planner, we had an exercise. We would always, you know have exercises on how we would fight as the first armored division as part of seventh corps as part of u.s army europe as part of nato there was a uh, uh we had the Meinigen gap uh which was a an area where we thought the soviets would come into our sector and then there was another uh, area a route coming into our sector from the south that came out of a, a town called karlovy Vary in czechoslovakia which was a major hub of uh, Soviet uh, armor and equipment. In seeing the old Russian Soviet motor pools that were there, Warsaw Pact motor pools that were there, I don't know how to say this, but just the, the, the squalor uh, that they were living in, both in their barracks, their motor pools were an environmental disaster from oil and gasoline and diesel fuel all over the place. The equipment was in really bad shape. It just, you know, it, it made me realize for the first time as a young major that this grand Soviet army was not all that grand. I believe no doubt as to who lost the war. So you hear about this, you hear about the soldier to your right and the soldier to your left. See, in, in Berlin, I think they were going to give us maybe four days had the balloon gone up. Now, it's inside there, in, in the brigade, us soldiers, we had this running joke. The Soviets were just going to bypass Berlin, bypass us and stick a wall, stick a sign on the wall that read Stalag Berlin and keep moving. See, they were just going to leave us alone because why stop with us? Berlin. 
yeah, because then they they don't care. And that Kennedy was uh, when he made the statement, he did, you know, back then and said, "I, ich bin ein Berliner," where everybody makes joke because it was right, the right wording. By the way, um, he didn't say donut. A Berliner is a Berliner. The roots of the Cold War are undoubtedly rooted in Berlin. When we think about the Cold War, we often envision these proxy wars in Korea, Vietnam. Southeast Asia. Uh, but throughout the 1940s through the 1960s, especially, Berlin, this contested, divided city, was front and center in international discourse about these ongoing international tensions, predominantly between the United States and the Soviet Union. And in so many instances, and the, the reporting and the photography and the news briefs of the time speak to all of this, the high tensions that often prevailed in the capital of Berlin, at tanks of opposite sides uh, staring down each other's barrels. And if one person uh, steps on the trigger prematurely, that can ignite into World War III. These were the prevailing fears that permeated throughout Berlin and, and their ripple effects were felt all throughout the world. Gorbachev, reißen Sie diese Mauern nieder. No, no. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, the first time I saw the wall was in 1975 as a brand new second lieutenant. And what went through my, my mind is, this is real. On the other side of this wall are millions of people who aren't going anywhere. The communist government they live under will not let them out. Now, had they actually come across the wall, they would have given us about four days to a week. Now, the reality was, and we talked about it openly, the guy to my right and the guy to my left, that's all, that's it. That's it. No one's coming to save us. No one was going to come to save us. Here we were. We were all we had. We were 110 miles behind the Iron Curtain. No one's going to launch a rescue mission. The 1st Armored Division is not going to form up and spearhead into East Germany to launch a rescue operation. That's it. We were there and no one was coming for us. So we knew if it had ever happened, that the guy on the right and the guy to my left were the only two I could count on. And the same for the next person and the next person and so on and so on. So for the 
camaraderie building or the camaraderie between those of us that were in Berlin. Yes, it was there. And I think that's why it's stuck and it's lasted for so long. We knew what we had, what we were facing, what we were dealing with, and of course the uniqueness of it all. But at the same time, the reality was if this ever happened, we knew that what the result was going to be. So it does form a bond. It forms that unique bond. In that date in 1961, when the wall started going up, that was one of the things that the planners had not anticipated. For me, the building of the Berlin Wall is closely connected to the story of my family. At the time, my father lived as a tenant with my grandparents. He had fallen in love with my mother, but there was a problem. He was already engaged to somebody else. And his um, fiancé wanted to leave East Germany as soon as possible, and my father had initially agreed to it. So... Um, it was a special day. It was August the 13th of 1961 when he decided to break off the engagement. It was a dramatic meeting. Um, as far as I would told, a vase got broken and the engagement ring was thrown at him and um, stuff like that. And after that, my father took a taxi to my grandparents uh, to make a real old school proposal. So, and um, on his way, the taxi driver um, was in a state of shock. And he told my father, uh, did, you, did you hear the communists had started to build a wall between East and West Berlin? Uh, that's impossible. How cruel is that? So, and at the end, my father's decision uh, to, 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 marry, to marry my mother implied um, at the same time a life behind the Iron Curtain for the next years for sure, or decades, nobody could know. And only 28 years later, my parents um, were part of the audience of the legendary reunification concert um, of the West Berlin Philharmonics. And, and only then they could visit again um, their West Berlin uh, friends for many, many years. We had no family in, 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 in West Berlin or West Germany, but many, many close friends. They were able to visit us, but we were not able to visit them. So it was really the, the contacts you could have were very limited. They lived their whole life there and they were happily um, married um, until the end. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my, my dad died uh, last December. So mm -hmm. until death, they were happily, uh, happily married every single day. First time I saw the wall, I was 22 years old, and I was really struck by just how colorful it was. It was, uh, the graffiti was something that was very telling to me. The first time I saw the wall, I was a private first class in the U.S. Army. I was assigned to uh, Germany. I was a writer. You're at the tip of the spear. You're, you're, you're there you're at the front lines this is where it's all happening this is where east meets west so the one thing they didn't plan for was that the russians would build a wall inside of a city for centuries walls have been built to keep out invading armies but this was the first wall in all recorded history to keep an entire country from fleeing Hangs in the balance. So, uh, there's always uh, so the border between West Germany and East Germany that was a fence uh, and, you know, like a normal, a little bit more fortified border, like to Mexico, America to Mexico. Uh, in Berlin, it was a different story. So, uh, the border to the not Berlin part, to Brandenburg, was only a fence. And the wall was actually only dividing East and West Germany. But it was a, not just the wall, the wall was a final piece of obstacle um, to cross the border. 
Um, there was also an area where you had like um, sand that you can see footsteps. You had like walkways for for dogs. Uh, in a, in the past, they had um, uh, tank bo uh, barriers, and uh, then you have another wall we call it Hinterland. Uh, uh, so Hinterland is I think the English word Hinterland wall, um, which was the first one where they tried to stop somebody. If you if you cross that, they would shoot at you. So they say like. At this point, you risk your life. And then there was a stretch, and that could differ from 50 yards to a couple hundred yards that you had to cross to get to the actual wall. And then you had to cross that, which was not easy. Um, as you remember how the wall looked like with this top, with this round top, all that was designed to make it hard to cross. Uh, also, the, the I don't know if you know, remember the shape. They did this to stop vehicles. That they did not have to put the, the tank barriers there anymore. So it was really thought through to make it look uh, okay, but was engineered to stop it crossing. And that was going through the city. There were some exceptions when they had luck, uh, like with the uh, river, the River Spree was, you know, going through Berlin. And that's also the longest stretch of wall that you still find. It's the East Side Gallery, which is next to the river. So there they put, you know, it's like, okay, you have to cross the border. The wall was actually in East Germany and the river was the border, but they had then border patrol. And that was the only part where they didn't have that yeah, uh, other system in place. And that's really hard. If you see pictures, Brandenburg, uh, Brandenburg Gate or Potsdamer Platz, that was really big gap. Um, then you see uh, how it looked like. And also when you see the development of the wall, like a Bornholmer, uh, not, not a Bernauer Straße, so Bornholmer is a crossing, a Bernauer Straße where the uh, border was, the, the, the building was a border. <laughs> so the back of the building uh, was already uh, West Berlin and the front was East Berlin. And that's where you have the famous uh, video where they jump out of the window and that kind of stuff. And they were closed it, uh, uh, the windows that to block it and then tore down the, the buildings. And that's where they built the border system, right? Because they tore down the buildings and then built the one wall, the other wall with the border strip and the watchtowers in between. And that was going through downtown uh, Berlin because they divided, the city was divided right in the middle. As we said before, it's like Times Square, Broadway, you know, tear down a building left and right and have a whatever 100 yard border going through middle of New York. North to south. Psh, done. Checkpoint Charlie today is still there. Uh, it still has the sign of you are now entering the American sector, you're now entering the French sector, you're now entering the Russian sector. Um, but the difference is there's no wall nearby. There are pieces of the wall nearby all around the actual original checkpoint that is the place where the famous tanks were face to face. Uh, there's McDonald's, there's a Starbucks there. There's uh, a couple of souvenir shops. Ultimately, the, the city belongs to the people of Berlin. And I, I encountered a similar scenario where in some cases, uh, officers in the current military have taken offense that the French would go and sunbathe and play volleyball on the beaches of Normandy. But at the same time, one must understand that the reason why these U.S. troops stormed the beaches of Normandy or were at Checkpoint Charlie was to offer this greater degree of freedom and security for the people who lived in these besieged places. I to drive the staff car and they wrote up travel orders for me. And I got to the checkpoint on the inner German border. I was told there would be two small nondescript buildings, one on each side of the, of the borderline. Uh, with the fence, you know, some fencing there. I said, I was told, go into the first building. There'd be in some American uh, master sergeant, I was told, would look over my orders and then he would send me on to the other side. And I'd go into a small room. There'd be a door with a painted over window with a small half moon slot. 
they told me, stick your orders in the slot, wait for them to come back out, and then you should be good to go. So I cleared the American side with no problems, went over to the East German side, stuck my paper in the, in the window, and I felt like, Jesus, it's taking kind of long. What's going on? All of a sudden, the door flew open, and here comes an East German border guard in what looked to me at the time like a full Nazi uniform. And he was, he was just jabbering at me in high-speed German, which I only spoke very little. I hadn't learned any much of the language yet. And he was, you know, pointing at my orders and just kind of half screaming at me. And I'm like, holy cow, they're going to hold me up at a gulag here. Um, but he fi I finally managed to convey, he finally managed to convey to me that there was a discrepancy in my paperwork. And it was multi-page orders, two places on the orders for my dates of travel, and they didn't match because my dates had changed in the week before I traveled. The personnel office at Stripes had updated one of the dates, but not the other. So hmm. I had to go back to the American side and have them fix that. And when I went back to the master sergeant, he got really pissed at himself. And I later learned that this was a little gotcha game that they played with each other, that when the paperwork wasn't right like this. You know, the message I got was, boy, the world's changing. And, and I had no idea at the time just how it was gonna change. <laughs> When I went to Berlin and did that whole experience going through the two checkpoints and going into Berlin, seeing the wall with the barbed wire and all of that, it really drove it home to me in a way that, you know, that nothing else could have. I talked to an old, a bunch of MBA folks about my career one day. And when I talked about patrolling the East German, West German border, they looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> the moral to the story is that freedom is a very tenuous thing. A city does not become free merely by calling it a free city. And you have to live for it and fight for it every day. It's not just something that happens. Eisenhower had this immense burden placed on his shoulders at the end of the Second World War because history shows us that winning the peace can be as difficult as winning the military struggle itself. And in this moment, in 1945, Eisenhower is looking back exactly 80 years to the gestures and leadership of Ulysses Grant. How was somebody like Ulysses Grant able to politically, not always racially, but politically reunite North and South? Two, three o'clock in the morning. It what didn't occur during the day. Uh, it always occurred when everybody was gone sleeping. So when you start calling people, you're probably going to get at least three or four of those soldiers who were still drinking downtown or out having a good time or doing whatever. So you would never be sure of getting the soldiers because the phone it wasn't a cell phone. It was a phone at their house or their quarters. Mm -hmm. But we would have to roll uh, to our assembly areas on the border and be prepared to fight. And that was practiced constantly. Now. One more thing, not only did we have to do this, but our family members had to do it too. Uh, so the family members, uh, there was a rule, um, a standard that you could never have less than a half a tank of gas in your car. And the reason for that was if there was ever a real live alert, the families had alerts too, where they would pack up in their cars, head toward Frankfurt. Uh, where they would do what's called a non-combatant uh, evacuation operation, which we call a NEO. Now of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army was rolling along. And it's high, high day, the army's on its way, held off and came to sound its storm. For wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling. Taking all this in, just insane. 
um, is way more than I could get my age at age 22 to understand the complexities of the Berlin Wall, the complexities of U.S.-Soviet relations, the complexities of uh, East German people separated from West German people. It was way more, way more than I could pr comprehend at the time. <laughs> Eric Yaw agreed to hide them in his trunk. And I, I said to him, you are now a member of my family. The Spitzners have strong views about walls, not just the Berlin example. Now a living history. Missouri is a small town. I mean, it's been, you know, I liken it to kind of Mayberry. Yes, you know, very small town flavor. Um, people know each other. You know, my grandfather was a postman there. First day getting the stripes. No, I wasn't intimidated. I was confused. <laughs> I was totally confused because it was not like anything I had ever seen in the military. I always refer to it as the military's journalism version of MASH. And that's what it was. We had characters, interesting characters, long histories, uh, really weird things happen. Um, we had the press club. And so, you know, I bartended there and I saw a lot of things uh, that just reminded me of MASH um, and the doctors and the nurses and everything. <laughs> Forefinger should be placed on the trigger at a point between the tip of the finger and the second joint. The finger should not touch the side of the receiver. In West Germany, United States Army troops patrolled the border. The Iron Curtain that divided the communist world. It just gave me so many experiences that, that I never would have had before. And for me, you know, a, a little kid from nowhere to like experience you know, all these high level things for a daily newspaper like the Stars and Strips was just mind boggling. It was really amazing to me. Eisenhower was most definitely the GI's general. He recognized newspapers like Stars and Stripes not only as a means of information and conveying all the important updates about contemporary events, but he also saw it as a crucial part of sustaining morale. And the likes of the Willie and Joe cartoons drawn by GI combat artist Bill Malden was an essential component in all of this. And of course, uh, Willie and Joe cartoons were well known for their scruffy, ragged appearances. These were common GIs who were always complaining, bickering. They were always dirty. They were not the spit and polish sort of infantrymen that George S. Patton aspired to. And of course, Patton you know, told his men and his officers to wear neckties as they were going into battle or he would find them. General, I'm going to personally 
shoot that paper hanging son of a It was the first thing you would do every morning is read the Stars and Stripes. So Stars and Stripes, which was a daily newspaper, was the only newspaper other than the German press in, in all of Europe. After I went to work at, at Stars and Stripes, I was working with the young military uh, guys. And the plus for them was that whether they were a good writer or not, first of all, they were active duty military and they understood the audience they were writing about. And that was so important because you uh, uh, get a reporter in from the States who has no idea of how the military organized rank structure, how a company or, uh, or um, uh, <laughs> user or, or you safe or any of these organizations work. And the military guy already has the plus Besides Stars and Stripes, usually got really good guys and, and men and women um, who wanted to be there and wanted to, to learn more about newspaper operations. Eisenhower's support of something like Letters to the Editor in Stars and Stripes really speaks to his professional demeanor. In my research, I have found numerous instances where soldiers would write letters to Eisenhower himself, uh, giving them insight on their, their plights and their experiences, or perhaps they were just a farm boy from Kansas like he was, and they, they had that common thread that made them want to connect. And so it, it really speaks to his sort of down to earth, grassroots idea about what was unique about American democracy and the ability to vent your grievances, to be able to share your opinion, even if you were in defiance of officers to an extent. Uh, that was something that was necessary to nurture a functional army in the name of the Republic. Uh, so it really all goes back to Eisenhower's worldview, his humble upbringing in Kansas and Texas. Uh, he saw himself in the experiences of many of his men, despite the fact that he himself had never been in combat. Uh, and he wanted to be a champion of their cause as much as they did. I remember when I got up to the desk, and I was just fully full of it. I blurted it out. Yeah. I wanted to be a DJ. I want to be a disc jockey. I want to be a newsman. Be a newsman, you know. And looked at me, and he said, you know, son, with a voice like that, You'll never make it. This was in 82. I was still fairly new. I'd been there less than two years. Uh, and President Reagan was due to, to visit West Berlin. That was the last stop of a 10-day trip that he'd made through Europe, a bunch of stops in Europe, doing a little showing of the flag to the Warsaw Pact and rallying the NATO allies uh, as, as him being the new president. Uh, and uh, we wanted to send a team to West Berlin to cover that last stop. And we were going to fly. I was about, I think there were like three. I was one of four reporters tapped for the team. And we had a photographer, two photographers going too. I've done probably a thousand stories in my day. And really the, the one story I still get excited about telling people about is the time I got to interview Motley Crue. So to be able to cover a concert and cover a press conference with Motley Crue was really one of the highlights. The first thing you need to know about the Stars and Stripes is it's a proving ground for military reporters. And there are young guys who show up with literally no experience, like myself, and it's up to the editors to mold you into a Stars and Stripes reporter. Uh, it was a great place to work, um, and I was lucky because people like Bob Wicker 
I worked in sports and I wanted so badly to be a columnist. He gave me a column. I couldn't believe it. And then I wanted so badly to be a bureau chief. And he went down the hall and I, I think I was one of his better military reporters. I worked pretty hard. And he went down the hall and he lobbied uh, with the colonel to make me a bureau chief. And I had my own bureau at the age of 26, which is amazing. And I was covering border troops in the Fulda Gap, the main invasion route they expected the Russians to come across. And so those types of opportunities, I, I've just been blessed. It was the best place I ever worked at um, to this day. I, I've never had the camaraderie and the care taken of me personally and professionally uh, that Stripes and the people there provided for me. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in the Army sometimes that's all it takes is to have a sliver of experience in something. And if someone gets wind of that, that becomes your job for the rest of your career. Welcome to the U.S. Army. Uh, so many great uh, staffers uh, at Stars and Stripes that you just can't count all of them. If you go to Stripes and you see the list of the 25-year people, you'll see, like, a hall of guys and men and women who um, have uh, taken stripes from its past to its uh, present, but great people. I think one of Eisenhower's great strengths in leadership is the fact that unlike many of his classmates at West Point, he had never been in combat. For many of his fellow officers who were his age, these individuals who would become two and three and four and five star generals during the Second World War, he had not been entrenched either physically or figuratively in the mindset of the First World War. He was able to stand back, take a look at certain strategic issues and think independently. And I think that ability to think independently look at issues and personnel and leaders at arm's length, be able to assess their strengths and their weaknesses is what empowered him at this crucial moment of history. All right. So I just got in, I got settled in. I was still settling in. I was still relatively new, but I picked up a copy of the Stars and Stripes. Again, first first real copy of the Stars and Stripes that I, that I picked up when I got there. I mean, I, the basic training, they don't let you read anything. And and if you do, well, you know, it's going to be the the Atlanta Journal-Constitution because that's what the biggest newspaper there in Fort Benning, closest to Fort Benning. Anyway, so I pick it up, all right? Still brand new, still a little like, wow, what am I doing here? So I open it up, and there it was. It was, a it was an article. It was an article about something that's about 20 miles from my hometown. It was the last ferry across the Rio Grande River. It was still, they were pulling it. They'd pull, it was a pull ferry. They'd go across and one car or two cars could go at a time, but they were human beings that were actually pulling that ferry across the Rio Grande River. Wow, this is from home. And it's like, okay, that kind of eased that anxiety. It was nice to read something there about home. And I was there and I kind of knew, okay, I'm good. Here's where I belong. Let's rock and roll. <laughs> It's called the Tel Tau Canal, T-E-L-T-O-W, Tel Tau Canal. And on the other side of the canal was East Germany. So it was like, um, that was that was it. it. It was like, well, not even maybe 500 yards, 500 meters from the uh, front gate, well within mortar range. And there we were. That's how close it was. For me, living in Germany was a complete treat. I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people, I enjoyed the food, enjoyed the culture, enjoyed everything about it. But it was, but going through the wall and I'm like, wow, I am in West Berlin. I just passed through the Berlin Wall. It was very, very cool feeling. Very, for, you know, a young reporter with Stars and Stripes, it was very cool. That authorities in communist Germany, appalled at the numbers who were fleeing to the West, threw up the wall. <laughs> 